gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Karen Osborne, president of the Osborne Group. Welcome, welcome to the 31st Resource Alliance International Fundraising Congress. You have come to an amazing, an amazing gathering. Look, at the, look around you. Look at all the people from so many countries that have come more than we've ever, ever had uh, before. So this is just a great, great start. And we wanted to start our conversation today. You know, our topic is women in philanthropy, but we wanted to start by finding out a little bit about you. So when I ask a question about you, I don't want a little meek, you know, like raise your hand. I want, woo, you know, big wave, let us know who you are. So the first thing I want to know is how many of you have attended the IFC for more than 10 years? I get a big, whoa, thank you, thank you. All right. How about some of you who this is your very first Wow! Oh, look at that. Wow. Well, welcome, welcome. We're so glad you're here. Now, how many of you, I've been doing this for a really long time, 33 years. How many of you have been in the fundraising business for 25 years or more? Let's see who's here. Oh, you know, that's, thank you. Oh, yeah, this is good. This is good. You know, it says something about our profession that we all keep coming back to learn, no matter how many years we've been in it. That's a really good thing. How many of you have been maybe 10 to 24 years you've been in the business? Let's see. Woo! Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, these are good. This is good. How about one to nine years? Ah, most of you. Most of you are in that one to nine years. Now, we need to welcome everybody who has only been in the business for less than a year. Who are you? Let's, well, let's welcome, whoa, whoa. Welcome, welcome. We are so glad that you're here. You've not only joined a terrific gathering, but you are now part of a noble, noble profession that's gonna serve you well for the rest of your life. So welcome. So today's topic is women in philanthropy, and you're going to meet five amazing women. And while you are listening to their their answers to our questions, while you're listening to their story and what they have to share, I want you thinking about what are the lessons? What is it that they are trying to tell us? What can I use? How can I take some inspiration and some ideas from these women and translate it back into, into my shop? As women are doing better politically, we're doing better uh, financially, we're doing better in so many ways, there's also the other side. Right? We continue to be vulnerable, and we have to uh, have this conversation with some of that in the background as well. 70% or more of the world's poor are women, and that means that their children, right? The children are in poverty as well. Four million women a year or more are trafficked across international borders. I mean, think about that. 58% of people living with HIV are women. Over 100 million, some say even 140 million women and girls undergo genital mutilation every year. So as we have this conversation about how well we're doing, it's juxtaposed to how vulnerable women still are and therefore how vulnerable their families are. And we want to keep that in mind as we go through our journey today. But, now, I want to hear all the guys in the room. Where are the guys? Let me see. Oh, guys, guys, guys. All right. I just want you to know that even though this is about women in philanthropy, we still love you. Let's hear it for the boys. All right. Just so you know, the love is there. The love is there. All right. So let us move forward. Uh, we're going to frame this conversation with a very, very big idea. Uh, you know, I, we talk about philanthropy, and sometimes people think that philanthropy is something rich people do. You know, they think philanthropy is, is something over there. 
But when you think about generosity, everybody can be generous. Everybody, no matter how much money they make, no matter what they do in life, everybody has the ability to be generous. Do you know these guys? Yeah, you met them? I love these guys. So that's Warren Buffett and Bill Gates. And they put out, you know, they put the whole notion of generosity out into the public discourse because they decided with their billionaire challenge that being generous is giving 50% of your wealth away. Huh, yeah, nice, right? Thank you, I'm, I'm with that, yes. Now, this couple from Canada, they won the lottery and they gave 98% of their winnings away. They decided that that's what, yeah, that was what was generous. My husband, Bob, many of you have met him in theory. Uh, he's here, though. <laughs> he was in uh, Tanzania uh, this year, and he met this incredible woman, Dr. Aratari. Aratari? And uh, did I say that right, Bob? Rakatari, thank you. Uh, and she, this, her generosity is she adopted 6,000 students that she sends to school for free. She adopted three villages where she's building wells and schools for them out of her own resources. That's what she decided was generous. Now, do we have any parents of teenagers in the room? How about teenage girls? Yeah, okay, so you are going to really relate to this story. So this young woman, uh, was very inspired, that's Melinda Gates there with uh, uh, Secretary uh, Hillary Clinton. And Melinda Gates and the whole 50% challenge inspired this young 14-year-old. So she comes marching home after hearing about it, as only a 14-year-old can, hand on her hip, and she says, Mom and Dad, how much money do we give away? So Dad says, well, we do all right. We're we're generous. I'm on a couple of boards, and I, I do all right. And mom says, oh, I'm, I'm generous, yeah. And she says, yes, but are we doing what the Gates are doing? Are we giving 50% of our, our wealth away? So dad says, well, we're not Bill Gates. We're not. What do you want me to do? Sell the house? Ha, ha, ha. Yes. <laughs> that is what I think you should do. And so sure enough, for six months, the family met around the kitchen table. And at the end of those six months, they decided to sell their home. And they used 50% of the net profit to buy a smaller house where the children had to share their bedrooms. They lost their rec room. They, they had to do with less. And they used the other 50% and gave it away to charity. They decided that they wanted to be part of this notion of generosity. So generosity is something that can come from anywhere and can be for anybody. And think about what the world would be like if everybody was generous and if everybody was as generous as the women you are about to meet personally. The first, our first guest is Anu Aga. And she devotes her time and energy to social causes. Her organization, Akanksha, is uh, d uh, dedicated to helping children, underprivileged children, in Mumbai and Pune. And uh, she helps manage two schools. And she's on the board of Teach for India. And she's one of Asia's top philanthropists. So let us meet her. First, how did your philanthropy begin? Uh, by training, I'm a social worker. But destiny took me to the corporate world. Okay. And uh, I was managing a company. And my 25-year-old son suddenly died in a car accident. Okay. And he was very keen that substantial part of our family income should go for social causes. After his death, I was very keen to do something. I was doing it always, but not in a very planned, systematic way. 
and I was looking for a credible NGO with, with which I could sort of really tie hands. And everyone suggested that I meet Shaheen Mystery in Mumbai and she was running an NGO called Akansha. I went and met her and that's how I started taking a great interest in the education area. I was invited to join the board and I brought the Akansha centers to Pune about 10 years ago. And then we asked her, what drives your philanthropy? Isn't that a great question? I think any Indian is aware that with our 8% GDP, it hasn't touched the lives of an average Indian. And there are so many issues that need looking into. For example, we have the highest number of malnourished children in the world. Uh, right now, almost all the kids are enrolled in school. But what happens after enrollment? They don't learn anything and they drop out very quickly. So education is in a mess. And I feel education is the key to people's future. Not that malnourishment is any less because without nourishment, they can't even think properly. But I came across Akansha and Teach for India and I find them excellent NGOs and I love working with them. So that's what took me into the uh, education area. So I feel we cannot prosper in a society that fails. And we have to think of our people, at least in the cities in which we live, we haven't reached out to the rural areas or in other cities. But where we operate, can we at least reach out to those people? So I think uh, we need to be extremely thick-skinned and insensitive not to share our time and our resources with people who, need, who are in great need of it. Our next question was, what do you expect from the organizations you support? And what does success look like from, from your point of view in terms of your giving? Of course, I mean, each organization has a vision, has a goal, and I would expect them to meet them. And I'm very happy to say that in Akansha and Teach for India, we are able to surpass our goals. And as a board member, we have very definite demands on the organization. We want them to tell us the impact not just leave it to, just say it's very good. Tell us uh, the data, how it is good. That again, what we had set out to do, we do it. We really impact the children. We make a difference in their lives. Uh, we make a difference in the thinking of people, mm -hmm. the ones who are working. Uh, we push each other's to change and uh, we firmly believe that you cannot change another person till you change yourself. So this is something I find very helpful. We uh, help each other to be in touch with ourselves also. And do you have a message to share with all of us today? I think giving is a very natural instinct. And it's a very joyful thing. And if you've not experienced it, I would say do it in a small way. And it's infectious. Select a cause in which you believe. And it's very fulfilling. Far more fulfilling than acquiring wealth, acquisition of wealth and having more for yourself. We all need to have a certain standard. But people like us have wealth beyond what we need for our greed also. So after that, instead of getting into a consumption pattern, it would be wonderful to reach out. And it's fun and enjoyable. It's not a duty or a chore.